could you please give me your full name as it is recorded on your birth certificate? William Stephen Ostaff. Do you have any nicknames, and if so, did you acquire it in the military? I just go by my middle name, uh, Steve, and no, I don't have any nicknames. Okay. Um, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland. I was actually, my birth certificate is Washington, D.C. Um, what was your job in the military? For most of the time, well, I started out as a mechanic, and then... Uh, when I joined the Army National Guard, I had two college degrees, the highest one being a Master of Science. I was 32 years old, and so I talked to the recruiter to see what jobs they had open. He said, do you want to be a me mechanic or a truck driver? Two college degrees. I was too old to become an officer because you have to become an officer by the time you're 32, and I was already 32, so I had to be enlisted. And I'd already been a truck driver, so I said, I'll be a mechanic. So I did that for about five years, and I switched over to combat engineer. Um, what do you remember most about your military service? My year of life in the Arabian Desert. Could you elaborate a little more on that? Well, that combat tour. Uh, <clears throat> and... I think um, it caused me a lot of stress, and since I retired in 07, three years after I got back from overseas, I had high blood pressure, and now I've been unwinding for about three or four years, and uh, my blood pressure's come down, and I've gotten off blood pressure medicine, and, uh, but I try, most of the time I try not to think about what you, what the experiences I had during that combat tour. Um, it just kind of raises my blood pressure, I guess. Um, but, you know, sometimes you dream about it, whether you like it or not. And, um, and so that's why normally it's not something I choose to talk about all the time. Um, were there any major battles that you were a part of? Well, I wasn't in the Battle of Fallujah. Uh, like I said, I was in the Sunni Triangle in the fall and winter of 0304, and that was kind of a pivotal time. The uh, 101st had left, and the strikers moved in, and that's when uh, I think... The, I think the Shias decided they'd put up with us. They're glad that we kicked out Saddam, and they would put up with us for about a year. But a year was about up, and and so uh, the Sunnis were just killing the Shias, the, the Shiites, and uh, everywhere. It, it just started to spread at that time. And uh, but we were in the Sunni triangle at that time, and we were receiving enemy fire, and people were dying. And I don't know if you call that a you know, a major battle or not, I guess not, but it's just what was going on. It was, I was in the worst, probably the place I was at, at any one time was at FOB, Ford Operating Base, Eagle, near Balot. Um, after the engagement, how did you soften or reduce the stress of combat? Well, like I said, um, I think it was harder on me because I was responsible for all the soldiers underneath me, like in my platoon. And you had to kind of uh, make the mission happen. You had to make everything work and get it the job done. If I was just an E-4, a private or a corporal specialist, um, you know, it just tell me what to do and I'd do it. I didn't have to worry about it. You didn't have so many people to worry about. But as a platoon sergeant, you know, if you make mistakes, people die. And uh, plus you had to, like like I said, make it happen. I mean, you had to encourage people, motivate people. You had to, you know, if things were bothering you, it's just not the kind of thing you would show. And I somehow got 
numb enough at the time to uh, handle it well, I thought, at the time. But there was no, well, I did, the only entertainment I ever did, I set up a ham radio for about six weeks. And with uh, Morse code, mostly, I contacted 18 countries and made 40 contacts with a little 10 watt radio and a five and a wire antenna, mostly with Morse code. Russia, Germany, places like that. And that was the only thing I did to, for fun. I well, a lot of the younger guys, we got them first chance to go to uh, like for R and R to. Uh, Dubai or wherever it was they went, Cutter or someplace, or you can go home for two weeks. But we, <clears throat> the the leaders always kind of sacrifice their interests for the lower ranking guys, the younger guys. And uh, as a result, I never got any break. But uh, but then I somebody had to escort a uh, when we were up at Mosul a. Uh, one of our injured soldiers to uh, partway home, and I flew with him to Germany. And uh, on the plane, it was pretty gross. I mean, there was people with missing arms and stuff. Uh, and then when we got to Germany, uh, you're usually doing about face and straight head straight back. You just go to wherever the military flight offices and say, "I need to go back to Iraq or Mosul," and they try to find you a flight. You may have to go to Kuwait and then fly up and. It took like three days to get back. And they said, I said, what is the holdup, you know? And I said, I want to go straight to Mosul. I don't want to go to Kuwait and spend a night somewhere and then just give me one flight. And after three days, I said, what's the holdup? They said, it was too hot. And they're not talking about temperature. They're talking about it's too much enemy fire to fly in there. And then when they flew in, you had to corkscrew down. So you wouldn't get shot at. You couldn't have come in low. You get shot. So they had to corkscrew, and then you get out of the plane, and the place, the whole country stinks like sewage. It's like, whoo! I forgot how bad this place stinks. But I did get to see my son while I was in Germany. I was there a few extra days, keeping that guy company till he flew back. That soldier we had to the states, and um, so I, I went to Germany and stayed a few days. Saw my son who was stationed there. Happened to run into him, and that was nice. So I was very lucky to have that before I went back to Iraq. That was one side benefit, I guess. Um, why did you choose to fight? Was it because of patriotism, or did you feel a need to serve your country? Well, like I was saying, um, once you joined, even though I was against the war in Vietnam, I always felt like if you were, I admired the people who did serve in our military and I always felt like if you're able to you should because there's a lot of people who are not able to be in the army because of several reasons you know they physically they have problems or right now they can't pass a written test or whatever and so if you can you should and I've always been very athletic and and I, I managed to do pretty well in fact, I started working out during my 20 years, and I, I got the highest score on the physical fitness test in my company 11 out of the last 12 years I was in. Uh, I was running 7 miles and doing 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups every other day for years. But I'm kind of slowing down now. Um, so I almost felt like it was uh, an honor to serve. But once a war comes up, it's not like, well, I'm going to sit this one out. You know, it's just you're there and you're counted on going. So whether you think this is a good war or not a, such a good war, you go anyway. It's just what you do. People depend on you. Um, what observations, if any, do you have about dust and its influence on your military life? On what? Dust. Like, did you have the, any problems with dust? Well, we sucked in a lot of dust in that desert. Uh, I haven't had any problems with that, as far as I know. Uh, Long-term health problems. 
one of the things I worried about was uh, on that mission to uh, near the Euphrates River when we had to operate a tar plant, which was an ocean nightmare uh, with the Arabs to try to fix up that main supply route. Uh, we were in a low area and we were getting ate up by sand flies. And they carry this disease. It came out actually and trapped some of them and tested them. And 50, one out of 50 had the leishmaniasis, this disease. And it's kind of a skin disease, but then it goes internal. And if you get it, it's, there was only like a few doctors in the Army that could give you the treatment. And it was like IV, heavy metals, and it sounded like chemotherapy or something. So it was bad stuff. And uh, at that point, my whole platoon and I, we were like sleeping out on cots in the open air. And we had mosquito netting, but the dust storms would kind of stir them up. And you see, you know, one out of 50 had disease, they said. And you look at your arms and you say, hmm, I got about 200 bites here. One out of 50. Hmm. <laughs> I said, uh, there's a four-year, it takes four months for it to actually show up. I'll be home by October. <laughs> but none of us got it. But I did see a whole plane load of engineers that did sleep in the wrong spot and got it, and they got shipped out. Uh, but that was, it's just the heat. I don't, I don't know, the dust storms, you know, you just dealt with it. You, you put a cloth over your mouth and your nose and you wore goggles or whatever, and the Army gave you these glasses that were tinted. And I don't know. Uh, it's just something you had to work around. It was hard on the equipment. We had to have maintenance every Saturday on the on the trucks and stuff to blow out, take an air compressor and blow out the air filters, getting parts and stuff. We had to do our own armor. We had to go to junkyards and cut up old armor and try to make armor for ourselves because we didn't weren't really issued any to protect ourselves. But that's not to do with the dust. But, yeah, that's, it was the heat. The heat was the just killer. I mean, you can't imagine, like, in the afternoon. It only got down to 90 degrees was the low point in the morning. And then by, it was over 100 by 9 o'clock in the morning, and it was up to 130 or something in the sun in the afternoon. And you could just go find some shade and sit there and sweat. It was just, you drink water, you carried water with you everywhere you went. And, I mean... I think my blood pressure went down to 105 over 55. I had a skin problem. I, it erupted. You would get strange diseases. Some of my soldiers would get sick, be laid in their bunk with fevers or something for three days, and then get up. I, who knows what we had. <laughs> what was it like for you when you returned home? Did you receive any elaborate welcome? Yeah, um... When we flew out of Mosul, we landed first in uh, Turkey. And it was some civilians there, Americans, in this little room. We came off the plane out of Iraq. We had our rifles. And they were clapping, welcoming us. Well, not welcoming us home. Not, the, not a welcome home, but, you know, welcoming us out of there. And I was surprised. It's like, that was a nice, well, gee, thank you. You know, that was nice. And then we got back to uh, an airport in New Jersey, and I felt like just laying on the ground and hugging the ground just to be home, you know. And people don't realize what a wonderful place we have. Um, um, yeah, people have been pretty, you know, you run into people who thank you for your service and so on. Uh, I don't know, I don't have any complaints about a welcome home. It was okay. Is there anything you miss about being in Iraq? Well, not a lot. Uh, it was an exciting time. It was... Uh, I like to meet people from other countries. I like to learn new foreign languages. 
I would just take a book and then ask somebody that spoke Arabic and English, you know, what's the word, Arabic word for such and such? And I just kept track. Yes, no. We had to learn the numbers, look at license plates. and You, you know, so you just started my own dictionary. But um, I, I like that. I like meeting the, uh, the Koreans and the Italians and the Ukrainians. And, and uh, a lot of the Arabs were helpful to us. I mean, on Nazaria, the Shias, they were generally ex glad we were there, I think. And, uh, they were they were nice people, and they're really civilized. I mean, they have a lot of uh, uh, customs and controls about behavior because of their religion, uh, and they have this uh, belief that, like the community of a community sense of community, like the village to raise a child. Like, if there were kids running around and they were misbehaving, they would steal stuff out of your Humvee or something, you know. One time somebody st stole a GPS that some soldier owned, and he had to pay. He complained to the guy that ran the ice house, because we went and bought our own ice to cool down our water. We just couldn't live on 130-degree water. So I got the job of going in fully armed into town to this ice plant every day for a while in the summer to buy ice. We'd take up our collection of our own money, and it wasn't even authorized. But I got to, so I was always amongst, outside the wire, but the Arabs were, uh, and, and if a child was mis misbehaving, it didn't matter if it was their child or not. I mean, they would get after them, make, you know, discipline them. And so they're very civilized in that regard. And I, I they were, they would bring us into our homes. Uh, I never saw the women or girls or anything. They kept them hidden. American soldiers, uh, the Arab women, you know, you'd see them in burqas in town, the big black, long black thing covering them from head to toe. Out in the country, they had, uh, out in the desert, they had Bedouins, which is this word for sheep and sheep herders, and they're a whole different kind of people, but they would more wear more colorful clothing, live in tents, raise sheep. I don't know what they ate and how they survived the heat, but. Uh, but I enjoyed uh, meeting some, you know, some of the Iraqis, and they were good people. They, some of them had it pretty rough, but it's the tribal thing, you know, the Shias versus the... Uh, I once uh, wrote a... There was this guy, he was a Muslim up in Mosul, and he had worked... He had a college degree there, but he was, he was making $6 a day. We hired him to cut hair, a barber. He'd been there for quite a while. And he asked me to write him a reference so he could apply for a scholarship, like a Fulbright or something scholarship. And uh, so I just wrote a, you know, a reference letter saying he had been working here, hadn't caused any trouble, seemed like a good character. And, and I had to get a memory stick because our army computers were all jammed up with dust and uh, couldn't print. And I got a memory. I bought him a memory stick off a, an Iraqi. And they ran an internet cafe, the, these other Iraqis on post. The soldiers go in and pay like a dollar for half an hour to email home at that time. So we'd already been there for almost a year, and things were starting to get developed. We didn't have that in the early stages. We had nothing. I had a little shortwave radio I brought with me. I'd bought it at a yard sale, and I heard got the BBC out of Africa during the summer, and I heard about our casualties before they came down through the chain of command. And I could go say, hey, Captain, there's another one of our soldiers was killed in Baghdad or something. But uh, anyway, they, they had an internet cafe, and, and they're actually there. I think they were Christians running the internet cafe, Iraqis. And I said I wanted them to print this off. And he said, do you realize that he's a Muslim or a Sunni or whatever he was? I said, well, yeah, so what? That's, you know, what it was like. So you might like both of them, but they don't like each other. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, that was all. I t like I said, overall, I think the heat was one of the hardest things to put up with. Um, <clears throat> do you remember your first assignment? Well, as a platoon sergeant, I had to send out that first squad. That was my job, to draw ammo and get them ready. And, uh, but then that first assignment, once we went north into Iraq, was uh, trying to run that asphalt plant 
to fix that main supply route. That was like the whole military's one of their top concerns is fixing that piece of road so we can move north in Iraq back and forth and resupply and all that. And that was a pretty important mission, but it was kind of a failure. That that plant just wasn't doing the job. But we were out there and did that, and that was my probably my first big mission. Well, I'd like to thank you for your service in, in the United States and for taking time out of your day to talk to me. You're welcome.